a proposal for a more robust GPS. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Peter Iannucci, postdoctoral research fellow at the Radio Navigation Laboratory at the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Tanya. What happens at UT's Radio Navigation Lab, and what's your role there? We study navigation technology. Um, this is tools for knowing where you are and how you're moving through space in a vehicle or um, a, as a pedestrian. We use tools like radar, GPS, and other forms of satellite navigation, as well as um, fusion techniques that combine sensor information from accelerometers and gyroscopes with these other forms of sensing. We study vision-based sensing and just generally all the ways of gaining confidence in your estimate of where you are as you move through space. One project in the news recently is using low Earth orbit satellite constellations as a more robust complement to our existing GPS network. Start at the beginning. What are some of the weaknesses of our existing GPS network? That's a great question. GPS is an open system in the sense that the types and contents of the signals that we receive on the ground are pretty much fully known and they don't contain any cryptographic protections that allow a receiver to know for sure that the signal they're getting is authentic. Moreover, there's no theoretical reason why an attacker can't record and play back a valid GPS receiver to trick a receiver into thinking it's in the wrong place. Um, this can have some pretty unpleasant consequences for cellular networks, which need exact timing to synchronize their transmissions, and for the power grid, which uses exact phasing information to keep track of the fluxes of power through various transmission lines. So we care a lot about assuredness. Uh, this has become a topic of national conversation, assuredness in positioning, navigation, and timing. GPS, in addition to having signals that are open, is uh, incredibly faint. These satellites are 20,000 kilometers away. They are transmitting with a few hundred watts of power and that butter gets spread thin over half of the planet. So these signals, when they arrive at the ground, are weaker than the voltages that correspond to the thermal jiggling of electrons in your antenna. They're 100 times smaller. Um, in terms of energy. So we have to look for ways to protect GPS, to toughen it and to augment it with other technologies that don't suffer from these weak signals and unauthenticatable signals. What satellites would provide this additional capability and what would their coverage be? There are three major projects that are currently underway at SpaceX, their Starlink system, at OneWeb, and at Amazon, their Project Kuiper, which are placing tens of thousands of internet satellites into orbit uh, about a thousand kilometers overhead. And these satellites are the ones that we have our eye on. The coverage will depend on some commercial realities that we aren't privy to yet. But depending on who pays and where they live, these companies could, at fairly low cost, provide service to the entire planet. So what cost and utilization load would GPS function add to the satellite constellation? To add a global navigation component to a broadband internet constellation, we've done some analysis and our conclusion is that it would take away about three quarters of a percent of the system's ability to download internet data. So if you're streaming cat videos or if you're on a Zoom call, that system has to route packets from the internet at large through special gateway stations uh, owned by, for instance, the SpaceX company up to the satellites and down to the users. And that downlink from the satellite to the users is the one that we want to do a purpose to also provide positioning, navigation, and timing. And that is the one that we would encumber by about three quarters of a percent. The other resources that are important on the satellite include solar power, which is a scarce resource. We think that about a third of a percent of that would be needed. 
and the antennas on the satellite have to be commanded to point in different directions than they would if there were no positioning, navigation, and, and timing service. And those commands to redirect the antenna, we believe will eat up about 5% of the system's ability to point its antennas in random directions. Those um, costs are things that we have carefully quantified and we will be revisiting those calculations as we get more and more information. So would access to these enhanced signals be reserved for military use or would maybe commercial and private uh, reception be available? The opportunity for the commercial providers would not be limited to military customers. In fact, Elon Musk recently made a statement that he thinks his, uh, his Starship Airlines is going to be 99% civilian uh, in the traffic that they carry. And similarly, in the ideal scenario, a commercial market for high integrity, high accuracy positioning and timing sort of takes root and creates enough civilian demand to finance this independently of military involvement. Ideally, we'd like to see the military be just another customer of that service. It doesn't benefit us personally, but it benefits humanity at large for this service to be available, at least commercially. Now, <clears throat> if the government decided it were a national priority to have civilian access to alternative navigation, they could certainly finance a public service. Uh, that's sort of a pie in the sky possibility. So what steps are left to make this an actual reality? The proposal that we have articulated is mainly focused on establishing feasibility. So we have, in a formal sense, we've abstracted out a lot of critical knowledge that we simply aren't privy to. This is proprietary information that, that Amazon, that OneWeb, and that SpaceX will know. In order for them to take our work and commercialize that, they're going to have to peel back some layers of abstraction and say, okay, our software is designed under certain assumptions, one satellite per location per time, for instance, and that would have to change. They would have to have multiple satellites providing multilateration signals to a given location at a given time. And we can tell you that in a, in a de novo greenfield environment, creating the software to organize such a, a task is not that big of a deal. But they are facing an operational reality of a beta testing system that's in operation that they've spent billions of dollars on. They can't afford to move fast and break things um, as far as prototyping the software changes to make our system a reality. So they might be quite conservative about what levels of quality assurance and study and engineering proposal and architecture are needed before we can get there. Our job as academics has been to establish the technical feasibility of the concept. And we are eager to speak on outlets like this one to get people excited about it. You know, if, if we can do a demo, for instance, without help from SpaceX and make them jealous so that they turn around and say, we could do that, we could do that better. Great, that's a win for me. If, if they decide to pursue this concept, that would be a win for humanity and it's a win for me. A win for humanity, I like that. Dr. Peter Iannucci, postdoctoral research fellow at the Radio Navigation Laboratory at the University of Texas at Austin. If somebody wants to connect with you, Peter, maybe they wanna understand more about this work, how can they do that? They can reach me on LinkedIn. Sounds good. Thank you very much. You're, yeah, of course. And find more of my interviews right here or at tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.